brothers and sisters in Christ. I greet you all in the name of the God our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is a beautiful and a blessed morning as we welcome uh, all four of our community congregations from Dummerston and from Guilford, from West Brattleboro, and from what's the last center, Center Congregational Church. I think those are the four. You will forgive me, I'm still quite new here and learning the ropes. It is um, a blessing and an honor to host all the congregations. One of uh, my most influential texts that I read when I was in seminary was the book Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, where he recognized and he affirmed the importance of Christian community. And that is what we are indeed celebrating this morning. I would ask that you take the opportunity to find our um, uh, registry book, which is found at the end of your pews, just to let us know who you are and, and from where you have come, we would like to welcome you and extend to you our hospitality. Remember, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at Center Congregational Church. In the spirit of sort of our community worship, we have some notices and announcements from all of the congregations. You'll find them in your service order. From the Guilford Church, I think they were um, advertising a film that will be uh, broadcasted in the weeks to come. From the Dummerston Church, there will be a forum on bullying that I ask you to take note of. At the Center Church, we have a fundraising event coming up on the 31st of August. And here in Brattleboro, there is a brown bag luncheon that focuses on the preservation of the environment. And it doesn't end there. On September 7th at Center Church, we will be hosting um, the gallery walk and the moment of peace. So I pray that whether you're from West Brat or or Dummerston or Guilford or from Brattleboro here that you'll take an opportunity to attend all of these events. Are there any other notices and announcements that folks may have from the pews? Yes, please, thank you. Uh, you're all welcome to the fellowship uh, time after service in the parlor in the store. And this is just a notice to members of this church that September is open for hosting that uh, coffee time, the time, and uh, we're looking for volunteers. Thank you. Any other announcements? This morning we will be uh, focusing on the wider church, as you can see from the chancel area. We're focusing on the wider church in our own community and the message, the state of Vermont. And um, with Margot, uh, during our uh, lighting of the candle of peace, um, the ministry overseas and abroad. A special welcome to uh, Lisa and to Sean uh, from our neighboring congregations. And also in absentia, um, uh, Audrey, uh, who cannot be with us this morning, but she is with us in spirit. So we also acknowledge her. At this time, I would like to invite the congregation just to stand and to greet one another, especially your neighbor from a fellow congregation. Let us be in fellowship with one another. <laughs>
congregation to please remain standing for our call to worship. It can be found in your service program. Let us call one another and God to be in this space. In this house, you will find bread for your life's journey. In Jesus, in my life. and eat this bread so you will never hunger. In Jesus, in my life, in Come, be strengthened in God to withstand the present night and the spiritual forces of evil. In Jesus, in my life, in Come, let us worship God, for the morning belongs to the church of the risen Christ. Our denomination 
is urging us to advocate for the resettlement of 75,000 people in the year to come. Vermont has historically been a welcoming state. The city of Burlington has been especially welcoming. Following international crises, the city has resettled refugees from Tibet, Bhutan, Burma, the former Yugoslavia, Somalia, Central and South America, and many other countries. Groups within the city have helped refugees find housing, jobs, and have offered English language classes. The sports within the schools have been vigorous. Even now, as many of the students from refugee families try to ready themselves for the world of work and even college, the city and our state are helping them by running a special program in the high school that guides them through various processes, such as vocational preparation, job applications, college preparation, and college application. In the rest of Vermont, we need to become aware that there are refugees among us and to find ways to support them. We need also to look beyond our borders to understand the needs of refugees in other places. A group within our church called Carry Me Home has been sending clothing and baby supplies to refugees still stuck in camps off the coast of Greece. The leader of that group recently visited several refugee camps in Greece and will, will be reporting back to us soon. We need to learn from her how we might be more helpful to them. It's a stretch for us who have most of what we really need to imagine what it would be like to have nothing. But we need to think about it, pray about it, and find ways that we can support those who have left everything they have known in the search for a new and better life for themselves and their families. This morning I like the peace candle with the hope that we in this community can find ways to offer peace and support to those who are fleeing from the war torn areas. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you watch over all of those who are on the road in search of safety and a better life for themselves and their children. Bless them and give them strength. Keep them safe and help us to make a space for them among us and to shower them with love as well as the many material things we humans need, food, clothing, and shelter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week, while sitting at my desk, I received a notice and a plea for prayer from my uh, former boss, the Reverend Jim Mose. And I would invite you to join with me in praying a prayer that he wrote. Will you pray it with me responsibly? God of our ancestors, many of whom fled violence and persecution in search of a new land, we know your love and compassion for refugees. We remember that Mary and Joseph once fled to Egypt with the Christ child to escape the murderous rampage of King Herod. We grieve the fact that in the midst of the worst refugee crisis in history, our country is increasingly closing our doors to them as fear, bigotry, and misinformation run rampant. Banish ignorance, hatred, and indifference from all hearts and remove barriers to love and justice. We pray for protection for refugees in the midst of dangerous travels. We 
pray that the forces of violence and destruction that drive refugees from their homes might be overcome with justice and peace. At this time when critical policy decisions are being made, we pray that those in power in our nation's capital would reopen the doors, that we might again welcome refugees in large numbers with joy and thanksgiving. We ask these things not as helpless bystanders, in Christ's name. You'd find page 675 in the New Century Hymnal. We will be reading that. I think it's responsible. And I will tell you, I'm hoping that we're not singing it. So can, is that all right? Are we supposed to sing it? Because it'll be a sad story. That's such a, all right. Okay. All right. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God of oh hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of God, my heart, heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O oh God of hosts, my ruler and my God. Happy are those who live in your house. Ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you. And whose heart are the high race to Zion.
who are having trouble with home or in school, and she still grew her magical secret thing with all these children and making them better. And I was thinking, I'd like to challenge you if I can. When you start school in the next few days, would you look for someone who needs a friend? Maybe someone who looks different? Maybe someone who dresses different? Who talks different? Someone that's just different. See if you could be their friend. Could you do that for me? Wouldn't that be exciting if you could have a secret friend? I think so too. So why don't we just have a little prayer about this, okay? Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to us and telling us that when we do something for someone else, it's just like doing it for God because we are all God's children no matter how we act or where we are. So thank you for the days ahead. And may we be a very secret miracle worker for you. Amen. Okay. Hi. Those children who would like to go to another room. The Gospel reading is found in the sixth chapter of John, verses 56 to 69. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then, what? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Here ended the lesson. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word.
Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Speaking as a historian, few, if any, historians argue that there was not an actual person named Jesus who ministered on earth at about 30 AD. It's a historical fact, even among secular or unbelieving historians. Contemporary, non-Christian sources document Jesus' existence. A document written in the late second century called the Optimus Meniscus Felix describes a debate between a Christian and a pagan at the Roman court of Ostia. And in this debate, Christians are accused of being cannibals. And during the early centuries of the faith, many suspected that Christians ate flesh and drank blood. Such misunderstandings occur when much of the scriptures are interpreted too literally. I don't know if any of you have ever raised teenage children, but I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite and one of my daughter's least favorite conversations. And it goes something like this. Madeline, I am literally starving. Dad, well, if that is the case, then you should phone Child Protective Services. <laughs> Actually, what you really mean, Madeline, is that you are figuratively starving. This is when Madeline rolls her eyes. Or, here's another conversation. Madeline, okay, and very sarcastically, And when I heard the news, it literally crushed me. Dad, it literally crushed you? <laughs> Madeline, yes, it literally crushed me. Every bone in my body was shattered and I had to undergo severe surgery and physical therapy. <laughs> Dad responds, yeah, I'm sure. And then Madeline comes back and she says, what? You don't believe me? You're killing me. You're literally killing me. <laughs> Have you ever seen the episode of The Big Bang Theory? It's one of my favorite shows when a similar exchange happens between Penny's dumb boyfriend and Sheldon Cooper. This is a dumb boyfriend, and many of you will remember this. I haven't been to a comic store in literally a million years. And Sheldon Cooper, literally, literally in a million years. I uh, once read a book entitled A Year of Living Biblically. One man's humble quest to follow the Bible as literally as possible. And the premise of the book was this. The author, A.J. Jacobs, strove to, literally, follow all of the rules in the Bible. And in the book, for example, Jacob cites Leviticus chapter 15, verse 20, which states, quote, You should not lie on a bed where a menstruating woman has lain, and you can't sit on a chair where she has sat. Well, Jacob's wife was not at all thrilled with this commandment. 
Therefore, to make things extremely difficult for her husband, she purposely sat on every single chair in the house. And Jacob had to only stand for weeks on end in his own home. Now, you're going to have to just read about the episode when he attempts to stone a person for adultery. But we're not going to go there. But the point of all of this, the story of my conversations with my daughter Madeline, and the Big Bang Theory, and the author Jacobs, is that the Bible cannot and should not be interpreted too literally. And for some reason, this is a controversial theological position for many of my fellow Christians of the more conservative, or shall we say, fundamentalist ilk. It should not be controversial to interpret the Bible in a non-literal or symbolic way. In fact, theologians, such as the one that the Women's Spirit Group, group is reading, John Spong argues that many, if not most, of all of our cherished biblical narratives should not be necessarily understood literally. And theologians have argued this for decades, such as Rudolf Holtman, if not for centuries. And it's amazing that so many of us have not learned the lesson of not taking the Bible too literally. It's amazing, I think, because Jesus so obviously taught that the ways of the past are sometimes obsolete. For example, no longer are we to seek an eye for an eye. It is also amazing because Jesus, even our scripture this morning, so often spoke in symbolic terms, non-literally. Yet today, as people of faith, we still do that which the Pharisees did. We want to, for example, condemn homosexuality, or we want to interpret the Bible to Literally. In our scripture reading this morning, we see that Jesus' interlocutors could only interpret Jesus' teachings literally. Jesus declared that he was the bread from heaven. Jesus stated that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And then when those who heard him, they started arguing amongst themselves. And they said, how can this man give us flesh to eat? Well, Jesus was unfazed. And he continued with the metaphor. Just as the living Father sent me in, I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is not the bread that your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. Now, let's, let's just take this from the top. Number one, Father is a metaphor for God. It does not mean that God has genitalia. Can I say that in church? And it doesn't mean that God is male. Two, Jesus was not talking about actual flesh. Three, Jesus is not even literally talking about bread. You see here we have metaphor on top of metaphor. Four, Jesus is not talking literally about blood. Five, it is arguable that even, quote, rising on the last day is not to be interpreted literally. Living forever can even be interpreted 
metaphorically. You see, when interpreting the scriptures too literally, that is, when we digest the Bible too literally, we can become confused like Jesus debaters. And to load metaphor on top of metaphor, we can develop indigestion. And if I go one step further, when we interpret the Bible too literally, the only thing we risk coming out of us is, well, diarrhea. History is replete with destructive interpretations of Scripture. For example, thousands were killed during the Reformation's Thirty Years' War over the pontiff's transubstantiation or Luther's calm substantiation. When bread does not mean literal flesh. Likewise today, callous and derogatory statements, callous and derogatory sayings, such as God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, are indications that we so often make the same errors as Jesus' detractors. When we interpret scripture, in the case of the creation story, too literally. So, what do I believe? Well, first and foremost, scripture for me is gospel. It is good news. And the emphasis is on good. Therefore, Scripture is to be used to build up, to strengthen, to empower, and to inspire. Second, because Scripture for me is good news, it communicates to me that God is love. Therefore, Scripture is to bring you and me closer together in love. And it is to bring all of us closer to God. Scripture, therefore, is not intended to drive us away from one another. Nor is it to be articulated to separate people from God. These past few days, a member of our own faith community, the United Church of Christ, has been receiving death threats. Read the United Kingdom's Independent or the Burlington Free Press, Newsweek, or even the comments. One of our own, the nation's first transgender gubernatorial candidate, is receiving death threats. And make no mistake about it, those threats are ultimately motivated by biblical literalism. An interpretation that is hateful and violent. I am very proud to serve this congregation here at Center Congregational Church because before I arrived, it declared itself to be open and affirming. It declared itself to be a church that proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ and Christ sought out and brought to wholeness those who were most ostracized by the society of his day. Against death threats, Christine would have my support. And I'm not talking about political support here. Don't miss interpret me. 
she would have my support against death threats if she were a Republican, no less. Against death threats, Christine would have my support if she remained male. Against death threats, Christine would have my support if she were heterosexual. Against death threats, Christine would have my support if she were not a Christian. Against death threats, Christine would have my support even if she did not belong to the United Church of Christ. Friends, why do I take this stand? Well, quite simply, it's because Christine and I share the same table in the same wider church. And Jesus said, it, quote, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. So it is with Christine and I, and so it is with all of us. This was the word of God, and it was preached to the people of God, and the people of God responded. Amen. Friends, may I ask in response if you will join with me in song by singing our response of hymn, number 361, Your Love, O God, has called us here. this great blessing of a sermon from Scott, having opened our hearts to the truth that we are all connected through Christ and in Christ. I have some prayer requests that I would like to read. I just ask that you hold the space for all these people. We don't know their stories, but certainly we know that they are in need of prayer. I would begin with prayers for Jennifer Ambler, who is a member of this church, for her family. Her mother has just passed away, and her father is going to be going into assisted living. So if we could hold her in our hearts. I would ask prayers for Ani Suke, who has just been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and for her husband and for her son as they receive this news. 
I would ask prayers for Don Long and for Pam Long, for Ian, for Taylor, for Pilar, for Bradford, and for Steve Fector, who is recovering from a lawnmower accident. Uh, and as he stays in Dartmouth Hospital, prayers for his full recovery and healing. I myself bring to this congregation concerns, as I'm sure many of you share, for Kaya Morris. Uh, just as it is a UCC story, she is a member of our, as you were talking about, um, Kaya Morris is an African-American legislator from Bennington. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was to participate with her in a podcast about how we, as church members, can face uh, the issue of white, white privilege and also of racism. And she let us know the day ahead that she and her family had received death threats and that she was not going to be able to participate. So in the two, year, two weeks since that happened, she's now decided to step down from her position. And it is just heartbreaking for me. Um, I worked with her uh, to get legislation done in the legislature in Vermont to set up uh, uh, a te uh, an evaluative team to make sure that our state offices are, are operating without racism as if that were a possibility. She's fought very hard for that and I think she's paid a very severe price. So I'd really like to add um, prayers for her and for her family. I would also like to ask for prayers for Call Me Home, this organization that works out of this church's basement for refugees who are still in Greece, for the CASP organization who is working with asylum seekers here in Vermont, for the Vermont Refugee Resettlement uh, Program works out of Burlington to welcome uh, refugees here into our state and for all of you, all of us who work locally to welcome refugees into our community. And finally, I would like to ask a special blessing for Scott and for this congregation as they welcome him and learn how to work together uh, in Christ's light and love. And for Audrey, uh, we haven't yet gotten to meet her, but I'm sure that West the West Brattleboro Congregational Church uh, is feeling very gratified that they know we have four settled pastors here in the community. That's something to give great thanks for. So let us then just pray together. Help us, Lord, dear God. Help us be the body of Christ. Help us set a welcoming table in our congregations and for each other, in this community, for people who may never step, step foot inside a church, in this state that we might guide our brothers and sisters to be the light of welcome, comfort, and strength which all God's children need. And may we build churches together that remind all Christians of who Christ called us to be so that we might be lights in the darkness of our times. I would also ask a special blessing for everyone here today, that you take whatever seed, whatever morsel has been given to you, that you take it and relish it, give thanks for it, and transform it into energy and work in this world. God bless each one of you, now and forever. Friends, have you ever thought about why the doxology follows the offering? Doxology comes from the Greek word doxologia, meaning words of glory. It follows an ascription of praise. Seen in this way, 
This offering which we are about to take this morning is an act of praise to God. It is through this offering that we honor God. Let us be generous in our praise of God. Our free will offerings and tithes will now be received.
heart, but before doing so, blessing one another. Go forth from here, filled with the bread of life. Share that bread with those you meet, so that they may taste the bread that will never let them know of hunger. May God's blessing be upon you. May Jesus' love attend to you. May the Holy Spirit sustain you until we meet again. Thank you.